have Raul Panza there uh, from ETH Zurich, who will give the um, second uh, colloquium in the um, series. So Rahul received his PhD in 1994 from Harvard University under the supervision of Joe Harris. After positions at University of Chicago, Caltech, he was a professor at Princeton University from 2001 to 2011 and has been a professor at TH Zurich since 2011. Since 2019, he has been the director of ITS. He has received numerous prizes, including a Clay Research Prize, a Compositio Prize, Infosys Prize, and has been an invited speaker at ICM in Beijing in 2002, and he was a plenary speaker in 2018 in Rio. So without further ado, we are very pleased to have Rahul Pandra Pande, who will tell us about algebraic curves, Hurwitz numbers, and meromorphic differentials. Okay, so thanks. Thank you, Izzet, for this introduction, and it's uh, it's an honor to speak here. And I wish I'd been to Turkey. I wish I was was in Turkey now, but actually I've never been. And I was thinking this morning, what was the closest I came? And the answer is pretty simple, actually. I decided it's thirty thousand feet, many times flying from Europe to India. And in fact, one time I had a very nice view of this coast near Izmir. So I've been always planning at some point to go to Izmir, but uh, this alas is in the future. Okay, so we start and uh, well, we discussed, I'll come back to this photo in the cover slide in a moment. So this talk has various parts and it starts uh, a long time ago and then we'll slowly come to the present. So it's, it starts around 1900 when Hurwitz proposed the following problem. So I'll try to put it in this way. So the problem is a simple problem, and, and it was uh, an idea of Hurwitz to think about it. And, it's, and he starts with the Riemann sphere. And this was not so long after, uh, well, the idea of Riemann sphere was still, let's say, a relatively new idea at the time, thinking about these things geometrically. So he starts with the Riemann sphere, and he chooses B points on the sphere. That's these B blue points. And the question he asks is a counting question, is how many Riemann surfaces appear as the degree D covers of P1 with simple branching over the B points. So the interesting term here is the simple branching. So what I mean by cover is that away from these branch points, it's really a topological D sheeted cover. So in particular, the, the covering object is also a surface. So if I look at the picture, you can draw this in various ways and you can think about this either as an algebraic geometer or a complex geometer or even a topologist. And so this is the picture, somehow the real picture here. If I look at this picture, there's the, this is supposed to be the P1 in the bottom. And this is describing the cover here. And away from the branch points, we have these D sheets. They should be one, two, three, all the way to D. And at the branch point, it's supposed to be simple branching. And the condition of simple branching means exactly two sheets come together. No more or no less, two sheets. And so I tried to draw it a little bit like, I try, I try to draw it this way, that's the standard way to draw it, but that loses some flavor of it because the actual picture is about surfaces, two-dimensional objects. And unfortunately, I draw them here as one-dimensional objects. Another example, which is kind of common one, is if I take P1 here with four branch points and I look at a double cover, then as a, in terms of polynomials, one can write it, draw it on the left-hand side, a topologist might draw it like in the right-hand side and the object on the top is a genus one surface. And if you want to know the genus that you're going to get on the surface, there's a nice formula. That's the riemann hurwitz formula, which says that if I start with P1 and I have B branch points and I'm looking at a degree D cover, this equation tells me how to calculate the genus upstairs. And it's a very simple proof by Euler characteristic. So somehow to make sure that I have not uh, been too confusing about what I mean by a simple branch point. I decided in this talk to actually show you a two-dimensional drawing, an actual faithful drawing of what a simple branch point looks like. And it looks like this. So that's the, the idea here is that the complex plane in the bottom here, that's the P1 or locally a part of the P1. And if I look up at a simple ramification point, it looks like the graph of the square root of Z. And here's a very nice computer generated uh, image of it. So somehow the point upstairs is over zero at somewhere in there. So that's the problem that Hurwitz posed. 
And he, so he proposes, so we just say it again, since it's kind of important here, we, we pick this, we pick B points on this P1 and we ask how many of these covers are there that have ramp, simple ramification at those points. And that gives us a number. That's the Horowitz number. It's the count of these covers of degree D with exactly uh, B branch points. And this, is, this equality here is using this riemann uh, Hurwitz relation. And then you could ask, well, do we want the cover upstairs to be connected or disconnected? And those are two different problems. You can ask the, the surface upstairs to be connected or disconnected. They're not very different. They're related by inclusion, exclusion, but in the formulas, they are different. So if I write nothing here, it means it's uh, possibly disconnected. And if I want to indicate it's connected, then I write this zero. And uh, Riemann addressed this problem in a couple of papers, but the paper where he presents a solution is this paper published in 1901 and Hurwitz then was in Zurich here at ETH. And uh, this, this is the title of the article in Math, Mathematician Hohen, and it's, uh, it's basically just on the number of Riemann surfaces with given branch points, is Verzweigenspunkten, that's the branch point. So it's exactly what we're discussing here, and that's the title of his paper. And he presents a solution. And the solution's very nice. And uh, the solution, so the, the problem that's posed is somehow a problem essentially in topology. And uh, the solution comes in uh, the theory of the symmetric group. And it comes immediately into the theory of the symmetric group, and it's by this, uh, this view of the problem. So if I want to count these covers, I can, I can uh, describe them by the monodromy of these sheets around the B branch point. So the idea here is I pick a base point on the P1, I look above the base point and I label these sheets one, two, all the way to D. And then I take a little loop around every single one of these points. And because it's a simple ramification, the monodromy, which is following these sheets around any one of these points will give a two cycle. They'll all be transpositions. And then the condition that it all pieces together is this nice group theoretic condition that the product is trivial in the symmetric group. And that's because if, if I go around all of them, I can pull the loop to the other side of the sphere and make it go away. So this is a very, very simple idea. And it says that you could either count these geometric or this topological problem of these covers of uh, P1 with simple ramification, or if you like group theory better, you can instead solve this problem in the symmetric group, which is trying to find solutions of transpositions that uh, equal that identity. And this is the theorem of Hurwitz that says that his number equals one over d factorial. And this, this factor is because at the beginning, I labeled these sheets one, one to d, and there was d factorial ways to do that. And I have to take away that overcounting. So it's one over d factorial times the number of solutions of this problem of picking B transpositions in this metric group that have the product of the identity. So that's uh, so now it's a, it's a completely group theoretic problem. And it's a problem that of course, for any particular D that's a, some particular symmetric group and some particular B, then you can just consider all the two cycles in the group it might take you a long time, but then you can solve this problem there. But Hurwitz is more clever than that. And he writes a kind of solution for this in his paper. So this is still his paper of 1901. And the solution, I don't really try to decode all of it. I mean, I don't explain here all of his notation, but he has a left-hand side, which will eventually become his Hurwitz number. And on the right-hand side, the important thing about a solution, it has some coefficients and some uh, numbers F and they're raised to this power W and for W in his paper, that's our branch point number. So he writes the answer as some sum over terms to the power of B. And uh, then he asks, what are these CI and FI? And then he writes a very fun sentence here where uh, this is on the, um, at the beginning of his paper. He says that uh, he had come this far and then in the summer before, that's the summer of 1900, uh, he met uh, Professor Emmanuel Lasker and he describes Lasker as the world chess champion and math mathematician. And he discussed these results with Lasker and then Lasker made a very insightful comment. And in it, the content of Lasker's comment is that uh, Hurwitz should be writing these answers in terms of the representation theory of the, of the symmetric group, in particular, the character theory that Frobenius had been developing then. And uh, 
So I, I, I always find interesting that T. Uh, Hurwitz describes Lasker first as the world chess champion and second as a math mathematician. And I should say that uh, if I, or I, I encourage anyone in this audience, if you ever meet Magnus Carlsen, I encourage you to inc include him in your paper. And, it's, uh, and it is the case, by the way, that Lasker still holds the record for being the world chess champion for the longest time. It hasn't yet, Magnus Carlsen hasn't yet beaten him. Anyway, so taking Lasker's hint, uh, Hurwitz starts writing these objects in, in, in language that we would now consider the representation theory of SN. And the final form of this formula uh, is usually attributed now to Burnside. And that says that this is the Hurwitz number, that problem we were discussing, either the topological problem or the problem in the group direct problem. And it's a sum, and that's, that's Hurwitz's sum of K. He had K issues here. And what that K is, is actually it's the number of partitions of D. And the summation runs over the irreducible representations of the symmetric group. And then for each irreducible representation, there's some coefficient, that's this Hurwitz's C. And then the more interesting one is F. So these are the coefficients that are raised to the, to the B, that's the branch number. So that's the, that's the modern view of this uh, formula. It just tells you that, well, there's a, there's a topological formula that can translate into group theory of the symmetric group. And you can solve that just explicitly in terms of the character table of the symmetric group. And that's the answer. And this is somehow a complete theory. And for this moment of completion, we can celebrate with a little bit of music here. And this is uh, Hurwitz. Hurwitz is in the center. Uh, this is when he was a professor at ETH. And uh, on one side is Albert Einstein, who was a, a friend of his, who was also on the faculty, was, was both a student of Hurwitz as an undergraduate at ETH, and then later he overlapped shortly as a faculty member. And on the other side is Hurwitz's daughter. And I had shown this some, to my, some of my students at ETH, and I was hoping they could tell from, oh, the other thing to know is this picture is taken on Hurwitz's balcony. And uh, I was trying to convince my students to try to find his street address, but so far no one has succeeded. Although I don't think this is a very hard problem. The... Okay, and this more or less concludes the uh, very distant past part of this lecture, which is the work of Hurwitz and his idea about this problem and more or less the complete solution here, which, in, and you might think that this is the end of the subject. How could you do better than this? And, uh, it is the case, that's what I thought when I learned these things uh, a long time ago. Okay, so now we uh, go forward a bit in time and the subject here now concerns uh, so the Gromov-Witten Gromov theory and what's called the Toda equations. So this is much later, this is let's say about a hundred years after the, the first uh, subject I mentioned here. So Gromov-Witten theory concerns uh, some target variety X, so that's some algebraic variety or actually it's a theory in symplectic geometry. So it could be this is a symplectic manifold. And it has a source uh, so that the target variety is kept fixed. And then we consider all of the maps from some genus G curve to X, some moduli of genus G curves to X, all maps from genus G curves to X. And these should be algebraic maps. And gromov witten theory very roughly is some theory of integration or some cycle theory of this modular space. And it's related to some ideas in physics, in particular what's called this topological string theory. And I was working on various aspects of this theory in the 90s, especially the late 90s. And uh, it happened that um, I met Iguchi, uh, Toru Iguchi a couple of times and also some of his collaborators, not very long, just a few conversations, but somehow those, those conversations with him changed the way I looked at a lot of things that I was thinking about then. And I worked on some different uh, problems based on his ideas. And one of the things he wrote was a, just an equation in a paper with Yang. He wrote an equation about this uh, Gromov-Witten theory of P1, which is kind of a complicated theory. It's a complicated theory to, to define in the sense that I defined you, I defined for you Hurwitz problem. And that's, a, that's something you can just define in one page and more or less, if you have a background in topology or group theory, you can understand it. But Gromov-Witten theory is much harder to define because in some sense, there's algebraic geometry and intersection theory and deformation theory. It can't really be avoided in the, de in the, in the uh, definition of it. But uh, Iguchi wrote down, as it, Iguchi and Yang wrote down a very nice equation that governed uh, this Gromov-Witten theory of P1. And 
as I said, it was just a very short conversation I had with him. And I started thinking about it because of course, if you're thinking about maps to P1, that looks like some, something in Hurwitz's world. And I started to try to think about how to uh, use this knowledge I had of this Hurwitz problem, which I considered essentially perfect, to try to uh, study this much more difficult problem about maps to P1. And the outcome of that was that uh, I could identify this Hurwitz's theory as a small piece of this gromov witten theory. And it occurred in a certain generating function. So this is this generating function I'm, I'm writing for you here. H, it has two parameters, a red, a red parameter, which is genus parameter and a, a green parameter, which is the degree parameter. And if you write this as you sum over all genera and you sum over all degrees, and this is I'm using the Hurwitz notation, and then I have some generating function parameters, a combinatorial coefficient, and then here is the Hurwitz number. Um, uh, so this, this one function contains all of the Hurwitz numbers in the connected form. And what I found is that I identified this part of the gromov witten theory to that Hurwitz theory. And then I looked at that equation that Iguchi and Yang wrote that uh, it amazingly, I could write just a very simple equation for the Hurwitz numbers. It's a, what's called, it's related to this total lattice hierarchy. So if you're familiar with that, you'll, you'll see this kind of shifting that you see in this total lattice. Anyway, this is the equation. So that's the generating function H. It occurs here, like occurs on the left-hand side and also occurs on the right-hand side. But there's these uh, shifted parameters, which tells you that actually this one equation computes all of Hurwitz's numbers. And you might say, well, what about the initial condition? And the initial condition is built in here. It's roughly speaking, the exponential starts with the number one. That's the initial condition that starts. But this equation solves the entire uh, Hurwitz theory with no further mathematical input. And I've always thought that if I could, if I ever met Hurwitz in some kind of time travel, you know, I could just communicate one equation, I communicate this equation to him, uh, because I think you would find it surprising. So there is um, something here that you should see, or, which is kind of clear is that I said before this Hurwitz theory was completely solved. Here it is, that's a solution. I could write it in one line. And now I'm proposing another way to solve it with by this, uh, this Toto equation. And in some sense, one should be able to prove the latter from the former. And I proposed this in a paper and fortunately Andrei Okunkov read that paper and he showed this is true actually. Yes, you can prove this Toto from that uh, representation theory. And this began, in some sense, the connection found there gave us this kind of toehold to understand this gromov witten theory of P1 and also then later the entire gromov witten theory of curves. But it was some kind of door that was opened through this Hurwitz. And the outcome of that finally is that we proved everything about this gromov witten theory of P1, the total equations, and also the analogous statements for higher genus curves. And they, the, the, the papers are here. That's my first paper, and then the one that Andre read. Actually, the, it turned out that we were both at the University of Chicago the year before and we were in offices next to each other, but we didn't speak at all. Although we were working on very related things, it took, uh, it took some time to figure out that we were working on the same subject. It's not my goal here to tell you about uh, how that theory goes further, but I wanted to just make one slide. I, I get one slide, which was some kind of hints if you want to know how to use uh, representation, the representation three formulation to prove this TOTA equation for the Hurwitz numbers. And uh, that has some theory and it's, a, it's a, as I said, this is the beginning of how to unravel the entire gromov witten theory of curves. And so it starts with this Fox space, this fermionic Fox space that comes by taking this uh, half infinite wedge representation of this infinite dimensional vector space. And if you take this connected uh, Hurwitz number series, uh, Hurwitz number generating series, take the exponential, you get the generating series for uh, possibly disconnected Hurwitz numbers. And it turns out, and this is where, this is somehow, this line here is the translation of that Burnside formula. It says that the generating series for Hurwitz numbers can be written as some kind of vacuum expectation in this Fox space. And it's by uh, very well studied operators, the vertex operators on the outside, and then some uh, basic operators in, in the theory of energy in the two cycle. 
And so if you accept this formula, then there's another theory about how such, uh, you know, how such matrix products are related to um, integrable systems, integrable hierarchies. And it was known that such things can be, uh, are related to this total lattice hierarchy. And so that's kind of the sequence of ideas. As I said, it's not the purpose of this talk to describe that path. But I wanted to say something else before I go on. So that, that's a, actually, but this was very important for me in some sense, this idea that this Hurwitz theory was not a dead theory. It was hundred years old, but it was not dead. It was, uh, it was still relevant to modern mathematics. And this was some example of that. And I, I wanted to say one thing is that, uh, that um, Eguchi passed away in 2019 and uh, his first, uh, the memorial conference was gonna be in March. 2020, and it was for me the very first event that was canceled by the pandemic. And uh, I mean, first of very many events canceled by the pandemic and that is still canceled. So I, th I thought I would take this moment to uh, put at least a slide for uh, Toru Aguchi. So he's a physicist who started his career, I think in Tokyo. And then eventually when I met him, he was already in Kyoto. And as I said, that I had a very, just a couple of conversations with him, just a few words, but they were kind of very important for me at the beginning of my career. I was going to give a lecture in Tokyo in March, 2020, but as I said, this was canceled. Okay, so uh, that's the story of P1. And you could say, well, all right, why are you jumping to the ground with P1? What about the point? Maps to the point. And that's, that's another story related to the KDV, maybe a more famous story. So we consider here the moduli space of curves. And the moduli space of curves means I fix some topology. So here's some, and I put some points on it. But then when I look at the moduli space, I vary the complex structures. The moduli is the varying of the complex structure. And uh, the easiest way to think about it is if the topology stays the same and I vary the complex structure, then I get this moduli space of genus G curves with N points, or sometimes they're called N punctures. Um, uh, but this space is non-compact. And the reason it's non-compact is because the points could meet because these points are supposed to be distinct, they could meet or uh, one of some neck of this uh, surface could be squeezed to create a node. But there's a very nice compactification that's by Deline Mumford. It says Deline Mumford stable curves and they include not only these topologies but also nodal ones. So there's a moduli space of, uh, of stable curves which is, as I said, if you've seen this before then you're very familiar with it. If, you're, if you have not, then you can think of this as some natural algebraic compactification of the moduli of smooth curves. This is a, a space that has complex dimension, 3G minus three plus N, which is the calculation that goes all the way back to Riemann. And this theory that what's what we call the gromov witten theory of the, what's called gromov witten theory of point now is some integration theory over this space. And then there's a question of what do you integrate? And you integrate some tautological classes and the standard one that's relevant in this discussion is what's called the cotangent line class. It's a certain class in H2 and there's one of these classes for every mark point. And geometrically it's the class that's the churn class, uh, the first churn class of the varying cotangent space at that point. So again, it's not so important what it is for this discussion but there are these uh, canonical uh, cotangent line classes. And this leads to this theory of descendant integration. And uh, this was actually came earlier than uh, this total equations for P1. So it's a theory of integration over the moduli space of curves. And you, the, the things we're integrating are these cotangent line classes. And the reason it's called integral is that these are cohomology classes and you can always represent cohomology classes here in terms of differential forms, and this is non-singular. This really, you can integrate this in old fashioned sense. Although we are always interested in cohomological pairings and they're just called integrals because out of uh, some um, connection to that integrating integration of differential forms. And so this is notation. It says that if I put these tau uh, insertions in the bracket, what I mean is that you integrate over MGN, you know what G it is because there's a G there, you know which N it is because that's how many taus there are. And then you know the exponents by these Ks. And Witten around 1990, so far before the Tota discussion, or I mean, five years before the Tota discussion, he studied these integrals and uh, 
you could write down, he wrote down this free energy, which is some generating function here. It's a generating series of all possible integrals. So he just captures them all. Doesn't leave anyone. They're all, so they all occur as coefficients in this uh, uh, free energy. And it's defined by summing over the genus, summing over the number of points. And it's written in a nice exponential form where I take an infinite sum of these tau's and expand it. And if you haven't seen this notation, it's just a concise way of writing all the generating, it's a generating function for all of these coefficients. And it has variables. It has one variable somehow for every power here. And if you take this generating function, you might ask, well, what, what, what is it? Or it contains a knowledge of all of these, uh, of these integrals or this, uh, these, it's cohomological data. And it turns out this is a very important knowledge. It tells you how to do a lot of things on the moduli space of curves. So you might be interested in, in what this is and, if, and Witten certainly was. And uh, to give you the, the tip of his conjecture, you write a function u, which is the second partial derivative with respect to the first variable. And he conjecture that satisfies the KDV equation. What is the KDV equation? Well, the KDV equation was written in the 19th century, Corteveig de Vries, and it was to model shallow water waves. And this is the equation. If you take this function u, which is in this uh, 19th century point of view, is the height of this wave, then it uh, has a time change and it has a change with respect to the spatial coordinate. And uh, so this was this model of this shallow, shallow water waves. And Witten amazingly conjectures precisely this free energy satisfies precisely that equation. And here I've written everything correctly with all the normalizations and the constants, uh, which is kind of, it was kind of an amazing conjecture at the time. It still is amazing. And you could say, well, what does water have to do with the moduli space of curves? And the answer of course is not much. It's just that uh, it happens that this KDV equation fits in a hierarchy and it's related to uh, a certain, um, a certain integrable system. And that it happens that, uh, that these integrals can be written in terms of some matrix integrals that satisfy, that was related to that so other description of that same, uh, same hierarchy. So it's not the case that somehow you prove them by somehow introducing water into your modular space. It doesn't work like this. And so the first proof was using Kinsevich's matrix model, which is a certain, certain way to write these integrals in terms of matrix integrals. And this used some analytic decomposition of the moduli space into cells. So that's kind of a long discussion of a piece of mathematics that's really kind of pretty, I think, but, uh, and surprising. But what is it related, what's the relation to Hurwitz? And the answer is that, well, it is actually, yeah, there is a connection to Hurwitz. And, Andrei Kunkov and I proved uh, these connections using, again, the theory of Hurwitz numbers. So Hurwitz's old theory comes back again, and uh, this provided a second proof of uh, Witten's conjectures and the connection to Kinsevich's matrix model. And this was, you know, by then I was really convinced that Hurwitz numbers are something interesting to study, even in modern mathematics. And if you want to see how that goes, it's a kind of a different path for uh, the proof, the connection of Hurwitz numbers to uh, Witten's conjecture in the KDV goes by a slightly different path. And the, the starting point uh, there, so I could say that the starting point for the connection of the Hurwitz numbers to Toda was in some sense, Burnside for the Burnside formula, but the starting point here is a different formula. It's called the ELSV formula. And it tells you how, but it's also a modern formula. I mean, not due to Hurwitz. These are, I'll give the dates in a moment, but it's a formula that tells you how to calculate this Hurwitz number, the one that I started this lecture with in terms of something much more complicated. So as I said, the conceptually, this is a very simple thing. There's a little twist here about a mu, which I'll mention. This is some essentially combinatorial group theoretic topological, something very simple. And this formula expresses it into some, as on the right hand side, something on the face of it much more complicated. So first of all, there's all these combinatorial factors which you can just forget about. Of course, it's important to get the right answer. But the interesting object here is it's the integration over the moduli space of curves. And uh, it 
And then what you integrate with the modular space of curves are these cotangent lines that are relevant to Witten's conjecture and then some other classes, geometric classes called Hodge classes. So the main thing to explain about what this formula is about is what is this new twist here? Because in the, the Hurwitz number I had explained was this, but now I replace this D with a partition. So this is a partition. In some sense, it's a partition of D of the degree. And what I ask is not Hurwitz covers that have only simple branch points, but I ask for Hurwitz covers that have simple branch points everywhere, except for one special point. And the branching above that special point is some arbitrary partition of D, which I fix. So in some sense, this is the idea is you study not just simple branching, but one branch point where there's complicated branching. And to be fair, Hurwitz studied all of these things. I just simplified the problem at the beginning to say simple branch points. So we also studied this. So there's this formula that came uh, in the study of moduli space of curves that expresses these uh, Hurwitz numbers with one uh, complicated ramification and all simple in terms of some integral of the moduli space of curves. And this formula, this, this is the ELSV formula. It's extremely useful and very nice formula. So this was written, this was um, proven around 2000. So the mathematicians there, Ekdal, Lando, Shapiro, and Weinstein. And they had a different view of it from the point of view of gromov witten theory. This is a very, uh, a very basic formula that comes in almost immediately from understanding relative gromov witten theory. And the path of that has been, I gave some references here. But if you start with this formula, again, there's a suggestion about if we want, if we want to relate Hurwitz, that's, he's sitting here, to uh, Witten's theory of KDV, that's somehow about these, we have to get rid of everything else in the formula. And the way to do that is to, we have to somehow get rid of these lambda classes. And the way to do that is we let these parts of this partition go to infinity. You increase them. And then if you increase them, you'll see that you can take the expansion of these. When you increase them, you put this on the top and the uh, leading order terms will be where I don't have any of these corrections. So this will, if I, if I look at the leading order terms, I send mu i to infinity, all these other classes will just disappear. And so that says that the asymptotics of these Hurwitz numbers carry the full information of Witten's theory of descendants. So here again, Hurwitz is coming and, and saying some, the, the, this Hurwitz theory is controlling again, a new problem, which is this, this theory of integration over the moduli space of curves, which arises in Witten's view of topological gravity. Uh, this is being entirely controlled by Hurwitz a hundred years before. But of course you have to look at Hurwitz the right way. It's the asymptotics of these Hurwitz numbers as these parts at that special point get bigger. And in the paper with Andre, we, we proved that these Hurwitz asymptotics exactly yield Kinsevich's matrix model and also and therefore prove Witten's conjecture. And again, it's not my goal here to uh, describe the details of that. That's all in the papers, but I, if you're interested, the steps are to reinterpret the Hurwitz numbers geometrically as certain graphs on the, on the curve upstairs. That's kind of a fun thing to do. There's many different ways to visualize the Hurwitz numbers. In this lecture, I've already, I mean, I've already, the beginning I started with two, which is as, G, as the actual topological covers or as group theory, but there's a way to visualize the, uh, maybe visualize, it is a visualization, but also mathematical representation of the Hurwitz numbers in terms of certain graphs drawn on surfaces. And when you take, when you take that point of view, you can look at the asymptotics as giving you some, uh, some theory of, of tilings of the surface with coefficients, and that actually gives you exactly the same as combinatorial models. This is explained in, uh, it's explained in this paper, this paper here. So I encourage you, if you're interested to look at that. So that's the uh, second, the second uh, non-trivial way for me that Hurwitz came hundred years later uh, into my somehow uh, research domain. And by then I was convinced and, so, and since then, so both of these things are somehow still in the past. The work here was done, I'm talking about work with Andre that's you know, close to two decades old. So, um, so yeah, so we've progressed now from, uh, we've progressed now from 
the historical part of this talk, which was Hurwitz around 1900, and then these two ways where this Hurwitz theory really uh, played non-trivial role in, in the work that I was doing with Andrei Okunkov about Gromovitan theory and integration of modular space of curves about 20 years ago. And the last part of the talk will be about what uh, the things we are thinking about in my group in Zurich, about the Hurwitz problem more or less now in the last years. But before I do that, I wanted to go back to the opening slide of the talk, which we discussed it. So this, this is a picture of Zurich. It's actually a picture over Zurich from a park near where I live. And uh, somehow this idea of this cloud is some kind of Hurwitz cover and there's the sunlight is projecting the cover over Zurich. So this is some representation of the Hurwitz cover. And this is some, uh, you know, some kind of uh, homage to Hurwitz who lived in Zurich. So you imagine him living under this cloud somewhere. And I should say that, that the photo I took, but the cloud was drawn by uh, a postdoc in my group named Hong Lu Fan. Okay, so where are we? All right, so then the last part of the talk is about what uh, the problems we're thinking about now related to, to Hurwitz. So I have to get there eventually, sorry. So there is a link of these notes on the PDF if you want to, there's, there's a PDF file that should be linked in the chat. Okay, so the, the current directions we are studying have to do um, with some, com some cohomological lift of the Hurwitz count. And that's the view of Hurwitz covers as a correspondence. And this is the main uh, perspective, the, the, the current perspective of study that we are pursuing. And this is very simple to explain. A Hurwitz cover has both a domain curve, that's upstairs. This is the upstairs and the target curve, that's the downstairs. And if I draw my Hurwitz cover uh, in the way that I've drawn it here, which is uh, the way, the, you know, not the full two dimensional way, but I have some domain curve here, which is the, this blue curve and it has some ramification points. So the data of a, of a Hurwitz cover consists of this curve upstairs, that's G. And this is some higher genus curve. That's this genus G curve. The genus is determined by the Riemann Hurwitz formula. And it has these points. That the, those are the special points where the ramification is occurring. And also I get a curve downstairs. That curve downstairs in our case is always P1 because our Hurwitz covers are all covers of P1. But it also comes with the locations of the branch points. Those are the ones that are right underneath the ramification points. So in this case, I would get um, a correspondence between some genus G moduli space with four points and genus zero with four points. The number of points is the same because the points are occurring simultaneously once as a branch point and once as a um, ramification point. But if you view this as a uh, cycle or correspondence, then it gives you a correspondence between this higher genus moduli space, which is, let us say, complicated, and a genus zero moduli space, which you might say is simpler. And the correspondence, uh, so correspondence is, an, is, is such a diagram and it's cohomologically much better and better behaved and one makes a lot of, there's a lot of advantages to think about these things in their compact manifestations. And, and it happens that all of these spaces have natural compactifications. I've already mentioned the compactifications of the genus G curves with mark points. Those are the Deline Mumford stable curves. And this Deline Mumford theory is from the sixties. So it tells you in this correspondence how you should replace the two bottom uh, parts, replace them with the Lean Mumford compactification. Uh, it doesn't tell you what to do with the Hurwitz cover part. That's a little bit more subtle. And there's a, there's a theory of that compactification. By now there's many ways to think about it, but the first one is called admissible covers. 
and it was developed by Harris Mumford in the 1980s, and not, de not developed in entirely in the abstract. They developed it for a certain reason related to studying the Kodaira dimension, the birational geometry of the multi space curves. But anyway, they did develop it and it sits right above. And so we have actually the lift of this very naive view of the Hurwitz covers lifts to a slightly more uh, refined view where we can look at all these objects are compact. So this Hurwitz, this Her, this, um, the geometry of this Hurwitz problem gives you a correspondence relating genus zero to genus G. And there's various things you can do with this correspondence, but it's, a, it's kind of an important bridge because it tells you some basic geometric canonical way to move cohomological information from the genus zero side to the genus G side. And that's been used a lot. The most fundamental question you can ask about this from the view of the correspondence, maybe basic is the right word. The most basic question you can ask is to compute this correspondence, which is to say that if I take this uh, manifold, this admissible covers, I can take its fundamental class and I could push it forward and it gives me some class on the product. That's that if I take this map, I, get, I take this product map, it maps the Hurwitz covers to the product of the domain moduli, and the target moduli. And uh, really in some sense, the most cohomologically fundamental question you can ask is what is that? What class is it here? That's somehow the fully cohomological lift of the much naive or Hurwitz problem. And you could say, well, what about Hurwitz's original problem? And you haven't lost anything. It turns out that this Hurwitz number turns out to be the degree of one of these. It's the degree of this map. This map turns out to be a finite map, if you think about it, and its degree is the Hurwitz number. So if a very small piece of this cohomological data is the original Hurwitz number, it's, uh, it's, it's there as a piece. And, but there's a lot more. So the Hurwitz number is there, but there is a lot more. And so you could say that a goal would be to write a formula for this correspondence. And that formula has to at least include all of the calculation of the Hurwitz numbers. But even that is a little strange thing to say. You could say, oh, what form could an answer take? I mean, a formula, a formula has an equal sign. So let's see, what is a formula? A formula has the thing you want and an equal sign and something on the other side. So if we want to write a formula, we better know something about the cohomology of these moduli spaces. Otherwise, how could we possibly write a formula? So this is a maybe slightly philosophical question is what form could an answer take? So that's kind of a serious question if you're, if you're thinking about writing a formula. If you can't even imagine what to write on the other side of the equality sign, probably it's gonna be difficult to write a formula. And so we would have to know how to write classes on the moduli space of curves. Now it turns out, so of course we have Kunitz, so this is a tensor product. And it turns out this side is pretty easy. We have, we have very good control of the moduli space of uh, genus G, genus zero cur curves with mark points because this is like more or less products of P1 up to some uh, quotient. But this side is very mysterious. And there's a lot of studying about various aspects of its cohomology, and, but it remains mysterious. Most of the cohomology is mysterious. This is a fair statement that all that, that this, the cohomology of this is some kind of vast ocean and most of it's completely mysterious. But there's a relatively small subspace, which is well-behaved. That's called the tautological ring. So although it's small, it's pretty hard to get out of it. And uh, most of the algebraic geometry constructions will lead you to this subspace. It's called the tautological ring. And it consists of subspaces you would just write as an algebraic geometer based on tautological structures related to the moduli space. These have to do with loci of fixed topological type or these cotangent line classes or kappas. So it's not my goal here to give you a formal definition, but these are all the reasonable classes and they've been very well studied. But no one tells you that anything you want, like particular, this Hurwitz correspondence is going to lie in uh, the subspace. So, but we know some aspects of the answer of calculating the class of the Hurwitz correspondence. The first one 
is um, it's um, some kind of small miracle is that this uh, class that we're looking for, the calculating this Hurwitz correspondence actually does lie in this total logical space. This was proven, I proved this with Carol Faber 16 years ago. And that proof, so that's kind of conceptually a good step because it says that in principle, you cannot, you can write a formula because these things are all things we can write, write classes. We, we can, so this, this, this uh, statement opens the door for a formula. Let's put it that way, opens the door. A formula. And uh, the second thing is we give some impractical algorithm to compute it. So I'm not gonna talk too much about that, but in some sense, there's some method to compute it. And then the third point we know is that we come in a different direction. So as we've been studying this more and more, I realized that there's another problem, which is called the double ramification cycle, which is some regularized version of this Hurwitz problem. And this has a very nice formula. So this is a world where there's very nice formulas, nice formulas. And, and somehow the uh, line of inquiry at the moment that's the most, most promising is to find some way to go from these nice formulas to this, uh, Hurwitz class, and that's not been completed yet. So the only thing, the only thing I can tell you are these two things: that they, they lives in total logical ring, and there's an impractical algorithm. And if this were the end of the talk, it'd be slightly disappointing because I introduce you these new, this new question, and I don't quite solve it for you. The solution is a formula. So we're not going to stop here. It turns out that if you look at this whole set of ideas in a slightly different way, it leads you in a different direction, and that's the last topic, and that has to do with modular meromorphic differentials. And this is, this is a very active, large subject now, and it's connected really a lot to Hurwitz covers. And I would say that covers not of P1, but of the elliptic curve. And you can see Eskin and Okunkov's work in that. But again, the, the issue here, the perspective is a slightly philosophical one. It says that if I'm studying a Riemann surface, uh, I, don't, I don't study a Riemann surface, a naked Riemann surface. I study a Riemann surface with some structure. And if I take the Riemann structure to have some kind of function or section, I could take a Riemann su surface with the rational function. And that gives me exactly this theory of Hurwitz covers because that rational function gives me map to P1 and this is my Hurwitz cover. But I could also consider all the other bundles. Well, what bundles do I have on a curve? And the answer is, well, I actually only have one bundle. It's the canonical bundle. In fact, that's why it's called the canonical bundle. Besides the trivial bundle, I have the canonical bundle and its powers. I have no other bundles. Of course, I could pick more structure, but if I want to consider all curves together, I only have the trivial bundle, the canonical bundle, and its powers. And so if I want to consider uh, theories of curves with an additional structure in this level of generality, I get a Hurwitz theory. That's the very first line. This is the trivial bundle. But I can also pick a meromorphic differential. And that gives you a theory of flat surfaces. And this is a, this is a, a very rich subject. And I can also consider a uh, moduli space of a curve with some uh, meromorphic K differential. This gives some version of, uh, uh, of uh, some version of this theory of flat surfaces, but this is more or less all I can do. And if you look at, think about this formula, if you think about this problem of the correspondence in this lens, that uh, you get a result, which is a little bit surprising, but that's a result actually from last year. It says that this, this regularized theory that has nice formulas actually computes the class of all of these things, except in Hurwitz case. So all these other ones, there's a nice formula for the, the corresponding uh, cycle class problem. It turns out that Hurwitz is the hardest one. So, but all of these other canonical constructors you can, and the last thing I wanted to explain is a little bit, just a little bit about the shape of how that formula, and that's a formula, so you can just really write it. It's the, and I wanted to just explain, just to show you what that looks like. And this is joint work with Young Han Bai, J, um, David Holmes, myself, Johanna Schmidt and uh, Rosa Schwartz. So I wanted to explain the shape, just to give you the shape of this form. You can look in the notes if you want to know what all these things are, but the idea there, and I only do it in the K equals one case, that's the flat surface case. That's where you want to pick a section of the uh, canonical bundle, which is the meromorphic differentials. And so the idea there is you pick some numbers that sum to 2g minus two, and the class problem is to look at the class in MGN bar of curves with points such that the points 
twisted by these numbers are uh, isomorphic, that land model is isomorphic to the, canon the canonical bundle. If you think about the Hurwitz problem, you can, you can cast it in this way also. In some sense, in the Hurwitz case, the negative ones would be the fiber over zero and the positive would be the fiber over infinity. And what does the formula look like? So it turns out there's this Pixton cycle and how are you going to get it? Well, it's tautological. So you have to sum over all strata. So you have to sum over all stable graphs, which are combinatorial objects. And for each one, you have to find some coefficient and there's a, a method to find some coefficient by averaging over all admissible weighting. So I give you the definition here. And as I said, I just want to explain the shape of the formula. So you have to sum over all, all stable graphs because those are the strata that cover the tautological classes. For each graph, we have to make some combinatorial coefficient that's gonna be some kind of admissible weighting. And then the answer is that this, uh, this cycle, so as I said, is some overall stable graphs, then some kind of regularized admissible weightings, and then some explicit class, some explicit tautological class on each one of these strata. And this is, uh, this is the formula one would like for actually the Hurwitz problem, but we don't know it, but in every other case, we know it. You get this, uh, you get this Pixton cycle of the regular, regularized problem. And if you want the geometric class, the one that's actually the closure of the geometric locus, it's related to this Pixton uh, cycle, the one we have a formula by a simple upper triangular transformation. And that gives the solution, I said, in all cases besides the Hurwitz case. And um, so the papers are here. And I think that's the end. Okay, so here is uh, Hurwitz again conducting on his balcony. Thank you, Rahul. Let me clap for everybody. Are there any questions? You should ask me what the relationship between Hurwitz and Frobenius is. All right, what's the relation between <laughs> Hurwitz and Frobenius? Frobenius was a professor at ETH and uh, he's from Berlin. And uh, after he spent about half his career at ETH and then he received an offer from the uh, university in Berlin, his hometown, so he left. And the ETH board then had this difficult problem of who to replace because Frobenius was you know, a great mathematician. And uh, their idea was that uh, they sent an emissary to Freiburg to convince Lindenstrauss in this transcendental number fame to come to Zurich. But uh, Lindenstrauss uh, declined this offer and more or less this emissary was about to return empty handed but someone told them, well, he should meet this guy Hurwitz. And he met Hurwitz more or less randomly on the street and had a small encounter, a very short encounter with him and went back to the ETH board and said, well, Lindenstrauss isn't coming, but Hurwitz seems like a solid guy, we should hire him. That's the condition. <laughs> but they surely they must have met at some point. I don't know that for sure. All right, if there are no other questions, let's thank Rahul again. I'll make noise for everybody. Um, well, hopefully we'll be able to uh, host you in Turkey sometime soon. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Raul. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Raul. Very nice, thanks. Bye.